talent that whispers uh, is going to be the title, it's going to be the main theme of it, but uh, probably just before I start there, uh, as a national coach, you know, a very privileged position, coaching a national team, uh, and part of my job, or the main part of my job, as I see it, is to, to create the very best environment so that my players can flourish, maximise their potential, and play well for their country. So there's a lots of things what go underneath that, a lot of difficulties that I face as a national coach because our national sport of rugby league is not centrally contracted. So we don't currently own the players, uh, the clubs own the players, their coaches, their chairman pay the majority of the wages to their players. And myself as a national coach, we borrow the players off the clubs at certain stages throughout the year and try and go out and perform very well at international level. So relationship building between the national coach and the governing body and the clubs is very, very important and a very important aspect of us trying to be successful. Now, the bit that I'm going to focus on um, is the challenge on, and I heard Warren Gatland say this, I was very fortunate last night to be at the Sports Personality of the Year Awards, and I heard Warren Gatland uh, in his acceptance speech say, good players make good coaches. And uh, he's pretty right in terms of what he's doing. So getting the good players, getting the best players, getting the best talent is obviously vital in terms of high performance. And that's not just in sport, that's in, in any walk of life that we've got. Uh, and what I really wanted to do now is this challenge or debate how we actually identify talent. How do we do that as a sport? How do you do that in your industries? Are we looking for the right things? Are we getting it right? Because it's a multi-million pound industry in terms of recruitment, getting talent right. Most of that money is spent when we get it wrong and we have to pay people off and recruit somebody else and it costs us more money. And it's a spiral what, what quite often gets out of control. So going back again to, to the Sports Personality of the Year Award last night, there's an array of sporting talent. The people on the stage, the people who are going up for awards, all the people who sit, lucky to sit right at the front of the award, they're the ones, they're, they're the talent. They're the ones who have, who have achieved things, have been very successful. And then if you look behind you, when you start those awards, there's 12,000 people in the audience. All there to watch these people. These people who watch on TV, these successful people. And it sort of begs the question, how, much of those, how many of those 12,000 people behind us is talent that whispers. There's four examples there. There's uh, four England rugby league players. And again, those of you who are, are fair with rugby league will recognise some of these people. Uh, but Ryan Hall is the top left. Okay, he's scoring a try, he's putting the ball down in the corner. He's recognised right now as the world's best winger. So, Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, he's up there with the very best. Sam Tompkins on the top right hand side, uh, he's just got a, a move to the New Zealand Warriors to play in the NRL. He's been our standout player in the Super League competition for the last probably three or four seasons now. He's reportedly going to be the highest paid English player in Rugby League. He's an outstanding talent. Uh, bottom right of the screen is James Roby. James Roby has been England's first choice hooker for the best part of six, seven years now. Nobody's got near him. There's lots of very good, other, good hookers in the competition, but no one's got near taking his spot off. He is the best hooker in our country by a long way. And the bottom left picture here is Jamie Peacock. Jamie Peacock's just recently retired from international sport, but he's been our captain for the last 10 years. So our captain of our country for the last 10 years is on the same picture as those other people. And, and what they've all got in common, what those people have got in common is not one of those were superstar kids. Not one of those were talent that shouts. Like we, if we walked out onto the grass field outside now and watched a, an under 15s game of rugby, regardless of whether you know rugby or not, we'd all probably be able to pick one or two players who we think were the best players because it's talent that shouts. It jumps out at you, it's obvious to see, 
and we can pick that and we can all say he'll be the best player moving forward and he'll be an England international player. Not one of these four players did that, yet they are our, four of our very best players that have played in recent times for our country. And we'll come back and explore, hopefully, some of the reasons why they have gone on to be some of the best players for our country as we go through the, the presentation. Uh, I'll give you some other examples of it. Uh, Asafa Powell, a Jamaican sprinter. Uh, he broke the world record, 9.78. He ran, broke the world record. He was an unknown uh, at high school. He ran 10.8 in the Jamaican high school trials. Uh, that's only good enough to get you to the semi-final. The competition is that good. Yet he went on to break a world record. Anybody who was interested in football, Iniesta and Xavi, world, uh, world Cup winners for Spain, Champions League winners for Barcelona, at their youth level, age 12, 13, 14, were not the standout players. In fact, by the age of 18, they'd lost more games they'd played in than they'd actually won. And yet they've gone on to achieve greatness. Michael Jordan, uh, arguably the best basketball player of all time. Uh, he could not get into his high school team at the age of 16. He missed the cut. He missed the team at 16. Yet he went on to be the, uh, the best uh, basketball player in the world. J.K. Rowling. Sold 450 million copies at the last count of, uh, of her book. But she got rejected numerous times before Bloomsbury publishers took the opportunity, took the chance to take her on. Talent that whispers, is, it's all around us, it's everywhere. Even the Beatles, the Beatles, two of the four Beatles were in the same class at school, never did music. Some teacher was sat there with all that talent in front of them in the room, but it wasn't recognised. It was talent that was whispering at that time. It was under the surface and it needed to get brought out. So probably the, the question what we're asking is how, how, do you spot, how do you spot a superstar that is not currently yet a superstar? What does talent that whispers really look like? I think if we've all got the, the definite answer, we'll all be worth a lot of money. We've got some suggestions and some sorts of ideas as to potentially what it may be. And the four principles I've got uh, to spot the talent that whispers are one, it's not the performance, it's not about the performance, it's about the story behind the performance. So, again, when, when we go and recruit junior players, um, a lot of our recruitment people, our recruitment personnel, go to watch games and they are looking at current performance. They are going out onto the field and watching the players play. How well are they playing at that time? Instead of looking at current potential. So uh, some of those areas, again, uh, is training age. So particularly in the sport that we play, you know, the kid who was 14 was playing better than the other kid at 14. He may have had uh, a father who was involved in the sport, like myself. He may be outperforming him because he's had a better education at an earlier age. He's had a better training age. He's, uh, he's had more resources available to him. Uh, a little bit of luck, born in the right part of the town, right uh, near a good school. Whatever it may be, there is a story behind the performance. So we're trying to measure potential, not performance. You know, imagine two 19-year-old sprinters. They're both 19, one runs 10.6, one runs 10.2. And you've got to pick which one you want to go forward to the Olympics in four years' time. Nearly all of us would pick the one 10.2. It's the obvious, it's the easy way, it's the one. The one who's running the fastest at the time. But we haven't looked at the story behind that performance. The one who's run 10.6, he's had no training, He's only watched videos on TV, he's gone and practised himself. He's had no resources, no education, and his potential to go from 10.6 to 9.8 is far greater than the bloke who's done 10.2 and had absolutely everything thrown at him. Uh, date of birth, relative age effect, things I'm sure a lot of people are aware of are very important as well. Um, and we quite often mistake talent for maturity. So as well as not looking at the potential, 
we just look at uh, somebody performing and we mistake it for talent. It's not, it's just that they are slightly more mature than other people. I think it really applies in business as well. A lot of companies suffer from high performance blindness, if you like. Let's just say there's a, there's a, a high level role available, high level executive role available. There's two candidates. Uh, candidate one uh, is led a thriving business in a thriving industry where the majority of the companies have succeeded. That's candidate number one. Candidate number two is <coughs> led a struggling firm in an industry where a lot of companies are failing. Again, which one would you choose? And there's a story behind both of those. There's a, the, there's a, you've got to look at what they've accomplished within the context of what their current industry is. And that's us in sport, that's in uh, industry, in education, I believe in all of it. You know, we're sat in a, a fantastic school here at Pocklington, an outstanding school. Again, if you had to choose a teacher from a school at Pocklington, I'm sure they're, they're getting far more A grades, then potentially the, the teacher who's, and no disrespect, working on, say, a council estate in Hull, and you had to choose which is the best teacher, we would probably all choose the one who's getting the A grades from Pocklington, but there's a story behind everything that we look at. So that's point number one, is it's not just about the performance, it's about the story behind the performance. Point number two, the principle number two, <coughs> understanding <coughs> for some of these people, the difference between a fatal flaw and an opportunity. So we're all aware of the equation that the performance equals potential minus interference, trying to work out what that interference is. And if that interference is something that is not, uh, is not something that is, is that bad that it cannot be fixed, if that, if that interference is just a flaw, a slight flaw, see that flaw as an opportunity rather than something that might stop it. And it is important. Very important. Weakness can be the opportunity. So again, going back to the sprinters, 10.6, 10.2. If the 10.6 is just a real simple technical flaw that as an expert on sprinting you can see and you know you can fix, you should see that as an opportunity rather than a weakness. And again, understanding what our strengths, what is very crucial to our, each of our industries, like what are they the be all and end alls, what can you not do without? If you know that, and it's not one of those things, again, that potentially is a talent that whispers. Number three, the third point for myself, uh, is don't make your gate too narrow. Don't look where we always look. So again, we're at a school now. If the school was looking to recruit a teacher, I'm sure it would look down the usual channels. It would look down the you know, the, the people with the appropriate certificates. You know, if you're looking for an executive, you'd probably go to a business college to find your executives. But quite often some of the talent that we want sits within our current surroundings. You know, we have, um, we have some outstanding staff within our organisation, within in the uh, England Rugby League team who well, I've got no doubt could turn their hands to different things because they've got the right type of skill set, the attitude to go and do that. But we, we often look, we need a new coach, we'll go look to where the normal coaches are. We don't look often beyond that narrow gate. And when we look at that narrow gate, uh, we're in danger of overlooking a lot of very impressive candidates from different fields. You know, again, I look at schools, and teaching, you know, teaching is a, is a fine skill, it's a great skill. <clears throat> but it's just not about the knowledge, it's about the personality. And I've, I've seen and visited lots of schools where the children get as much benefit, as much education, as much knowledge from speaking to the caretaker as they do from the teachers. And it's an interesting, an interesting point for us. That's point number three. Uh, point number four, putting passion over skills. And, and I want to, again, go back to these four people here. Uh, some of the reasons why I believe 
these four people, four players, are the very best players is because they got rejected. They got told at young ages, you are not good enough. So they never made the under 16 national team, which is like a big badge of honour. Most of the best players perceived to go on to be successful, make the England under 16s team. None of these players made that. <clears throat> Only two of these players, uh, James Roby and Sam Tompkins, got into the under 18s training squad. So two years on, they still hadn't made it. They still got told, well, you're sort of improving, but you are not good enough to be the elite. You're not good enough to be with us all the time. Uh, Jamie Peacock at the bottom, uh, he never made his Super League debut till he was 21. Most people who don't make the Super League debut by the time they're 19 or 20 stop playing rugby league and go find a different sport or a different occupation. He was 21 when he made his debut. If he had stopped, we would have lost our captain for the last 10 years. And Ryan Hall at the top, uh, Ryan Hall uh, didn't mature till he was 17. He was a small kid. He matured, he flourished and he came through. Now they all got told they weren't good enough. Not big enough, not strong enough. Go away, fight, show some grit, show some resilience. That's what they all did. And that's what's made these people, these players, four of our very, very best players. And it's difficult. When you're choosing uh, players for an international team, when you're choosing for whatever occupation you're in, do you want to pick the ones who have had no obstacles in their life? They've been told they're good all the way through. There's no bumps, no hurdles, plain sailing. Until they come to a point, a critical point, when England are playing against Australia or New Zealand, when the, it's the fan, I'm not saying it, when it gets a bit messy out there and there's some obstacles, who are you going to rely on? These four blokes who have come through all the career, or the talent that shouts at the beginning, that has sailed through it, which ones are going to push through for you? Which are the ones who are going to perform at the highest of highest levels? Not just a high level, the highest of highest levels. And again, in our sport, these are four players who've, who have shown that. And there's plenty more people in there as well. Uh, high potential recruiting. Take some balls to do. If you are recruiting for your industry, if I'm recruiting for my team, it's easy, it's, it's comfortable, it's easy to pick the ones who everybody else would pick. The ones who are flying in education, the ones who are flying in sport, the ones who are flying in business. It's safe, it's easy. But have they filled the potential? Or oh, have they got any potential? Have they already filled it? Have they at the, met the, the best they can get? Or have we got other people underneath that who aren't quite as good at that time, who've got a massive scope for potential? Are you going to pick the pale strawberry? That's not quite, quite yet right. Are you going to pick the juicy red one? What's going to rot pretty quickly? And again, in terms of identifying talent, choosing talent, picking talent, I'm not sure we're right, they're not, not right, but it's a challenge for us all to get the right people. Again, going back to these four, I will revisit them again before I finish. If they hadn't shown that resilience, that fight, they would have been lost. We'd have lost four of our very best players. How many of that 12,000 audience, how many of the audience here have potentially got a lot of talent that's whispered, that's maybe not been nurtured and not had the chance to come through? We need to broaden our horizons in terms of the people that we choose and the people that we don't choose. And I'll just leave you with the, the story of the, the Chinese bamboo plant, which is a, a great story of patience and perseverance and seeing beyond what you actually can see. And the Chinese bamboo plant is a, is a small seed that you plant. You plant this seed in the, in the most fertile ground you can and you water it and you feed it and you look after it and in 12 months time there's a, a sprout what's come out of the ground about this big. So the following 12 months you do the same again, you water it, you feed it, you look after it and it's not changed. And so the third year is the same again, look after it, nurture it, feed it 
and it's not changed again. Now at this point, most of us in our lives are kicking that one out the ground, planting something else, looking for somewhere else for something new, because that's not working. Fourth year, you do the same with the plant, nothing again. In the fifth year, in the space of six weeks, the Chinese bamboo plant grows 90 feet in six weeks. And the question is, has that bamboo plant, Chinese bamboo plant grown 90 feet in six weeks, or has it grown 90 feet in five years? The answer is it's grown 90 feet in five years. What it has been doing, it's been growing deep down, laying its foundations, getting itself strong, getting itself ready so that when it grows, as its growth spurt and all that potential comes out of that ground, that it's strong enough, robust enough, tough enough to withstand all the elements, all the wind, all the rain, all the snow, what comes at it, whatever it may be, the heat from the sun, that that Chinese bamboo plant can withstand that and be strong and maximise its potential. How many Chinese bamboo plants have we let go in rugby league? How many talent that whispers have we let go in rugby league? Probably far, far too many for us to worry about right now, but it's something that we are certainly as a sport very conscious of moving forward so we don't make the same mistakes again. Thank you very much.